Good morning, everyone. It's uh, great to be back. I've had four Sundays away ministering in uh, the churches that we've pioneered. The very first one we did in 1990 was Murray Bridge. Haven't been there for a while, and uh, um, Lifehouse Church, as it's called now, we had a great time. And then I went up to our CFC church in the hills, Blackwood Hills, great time. And then two weeks in Darwin, uh, Kath was there for a week earlier, and um, we had a, a, a wonderful time there. More Like Jesus, our series. So I want to share on making peace like Jesus. Um, in the Old Testament, um, the, the prophet Isaiah, uh, and the, 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 the Old Testament prophets are amazing. Um, how they talk about this longed for Messiah. Oh, they want the Messiah to come. Uh, they've been beaten, they've been attacked, they've been colonised, they've been put into slavery, both in Egypt and then in Babylon and Persia, and, and there's empires from uh, the Egyptians to the Assyrians to the Babylonians to the Greeks to the Romans that just run amuck on the Jewish people. So the, the prophetic statements that a Messiah would come to liberate them rings through from Genesis all the way through, particularly the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and, um, and Daniel. And so Isaiah, 700 years before the birth of Christ, he introduces <laughs> the long-awaited Messiah of the Jews, and he calls him the Prince of Peace. And Jesus is our powerful Prince of Peace. Look at this scripture. We often quote it at Christmas time, but uh, it's actually relevant, so relevant at all time. It says, for a child is born to us, a son is given to us, the government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Notice again, his government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of heaven's armies will make this happen. Jesus' kingdom rule of love and peace and justice on earth continues through his people. What Jesus inaugurated, the king of kings coming to earth inaugurating his kingdom, showing us in no uncertain terms what the kingdom of God is all about. That's why we have four records, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. How he talked and how he acted and reacted, his teachings, his ministry, shows the kingdom of God advancing. And as it was advancing, the devil opposed him and you find a lot of spiritual opposition. So the king visits the planet, inaugurates the kingdom, but the Old Testament prophets thought he was going to finally beat up the last colonizers, the Romans. And they're thinking in terms of the, when everything's wrapped up, when this Messiah comes, he's going to create a new earth. Sin and darkness and sin and, and, and violence is all going to be removed. And so they didn't see that his purpose was also to deal with the barrier between a sinless, perfect God and sinful, imperfect people and that he had to die on a cross. They didn't see that. They didn't talk a lot about that. It was there in the Old Testament prophetic writings, but their thinking is liberation, freedom from slavery, a new Moses, a new Nehemiah, a new Zerubbabel, you know, uh, liberate us from the Persians, liberate us from the Babylonians, liberate us from the Egyptians. But God's purpose was to liberate us from sin and the fear of death and to be able to impart the gift of eternal life and then through the resurrected Christ, the coming of the Holy Spirit to empower us to actually carry on Jesus' kingdom work until he comes back to this earth. And so um, his aim, and when Jesus comes back, he's going to reorder this fallen earth of ours. And, uh, and in the New Testament, Paul says it this way, for he himself is our peace. Notice that, he himself is our peace. That's why I've said this, he's our all-powerful Prince of Peace. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. So the New Testament identifies this Messiah, this Jewish Messiah 
as Jesus of Nazareth. And of course, the, the, the religious authorities went nuts. They go, what? No, 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 he's going to come back as a king. He's going to come back with armies. He's going he's to defeat the enemies of, Rome, of, of Israel. And uh, they didn't quite see that. He had to defeat the spiritual enemies first. And when he returns the second time and he reorders things and wraps everything up, that's going to be in God's good time. But in the meanwhile, his kingdom is advancing and must advance through you and me. Um, Jesus made that very, very clear. So the notion that, you know, the, the cross of Christ, so the, the kingdom of God advancing has got to fit in with the cross of Christ and, and the resurrection of Christ and the giving of the Holy Spirit. And so it's not one or the other. So the kingdom of God must continue to advance, but now it's through you and me, through his church. There's two and a half billion of us across the world. In almost every village across the world, there, there are Christians who are out working the kingdom message. And it's not a violence, it's a message of love, a message of peace, a message of, of fairness and justice. And, uh, and, and really what we're doing in, in, in Central Australia and in, in Darwin in many respects is, is endeavouring to love and, and to outwork justice and to care and support uh, the most needy. That's, that's Jesus' work. And that's, that's so important, the physical as well as the spiritual. And so the church has been entrapped over centuries going, oh, well, you know, it's just all social work. It's just all the physical condition. And they forget about the cross and the resurrection and, and the giving of the spirit to empower us to experience personal salvation, personal forgiveness. Or, 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 and so some go to that extreme. Others go, well, it's just all about preaching the gospel and getting people saved for heaven. And that's not true either. It's actually, we get people saved to serve on planet earth to advance the kingdom. And so when our time comes to go to heaven, that's gonna be for a very short time. So where is heaven? It's just all around about us. Jesus could appear and disappear, heaven, earth. And so uh, we'll be a spirit, our soul, our spirit goes to be with the Lord in heaven, but ult the ultimate aim is the resurrection of the body. And uh, Jesus, Paul says, Jesus is the first fruits, then us. Because when he reorders this earth and removes sin and Satan and darkness and reconstituted and all the pollution and all the damage that, that we do, it's all gonna be reordered, then we need, we need a new body to be able to live in it, a body like Jesus. And so, so that's the ultimate hope. It, and you read Revelation chapters 20, 21, the new Jerusalem coming down and the imagery of the river, the stream, it's actually an imagery of the Garden of Eden. God wants to restore back this earth to what it was in its pristine condition. And uh, human beings are just wrecking this earth. I, I listened to an article just the other day, or, sorry, a podcast of, um, of a new research that's been done, uh, of a major new book on, on environmentalism. And back in the early 60s, Rachel Carson wrote the book, uh, The Silent Spring, which actually awakened the world to the deadly effect of DDT and uh, the poisoning of the, of, the, of, of the ecosystem and how these poisons go up the food chain. And so ultimately, the environmental movement started uh, through Carson's book. This new one that's come out is revealing that we are destroying the insect population on Earth. It's unbelievable. The statistics that are coming out now is the destruction of insects, not just bees, and it's going to have a catastrophic effect upon human health and human behaviour. So they're looking at how the heck can we do it? And again, uh, as forests are being cut down, as farmlands and, and pesticides are being used, we're just destroying the insect population, and we need the insect population to function in life, yet no one thinks about the insects. So man just is disordered, man's misaligned. He's not living for God, he's not caring for his creation. And it grieves the Father, both the physical universe, the physical world, and, uh, and also, of course, the, the relational dimension of, of how we function and live together. So Jesus has gotta come back and reorder everything and uh, realign this world, but we need new bodies to be able to live with him and to rule with him on, on this earth. That's, that's what the scripture says. So Jesus is our powerful Prince of Peace. Secondly, Jesus has to become our personal peacemaker. Um, 
He is the real ruler of the earth, of this world, not just of heaven. And, uh, and he encourages us not to be fearful when our world becomes hostile. And if you look at history, there are times when the world has been so hostile towards uh, Christ and, and Christ followers. And, uh, and he says, look, don't, don't be fearful. You might be in a hostile situation right now where you are, I don't know. But this is what Jesus says to you and to me. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. That may be just the word that you need today. You might be in a hostile situation in your marriage, in your family, in relationships. And the Lord is here saying, hey, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I am the Prince of Peace and I can be your personal peacemaker. So Jesus, our Prince of Peace, he makes us overcoming peacemakers. We're part of the answer, not, not mired in the problem. And when you read some passages in the scripture that make you weep. In fact, I find myself oftentimes as I'm reading the gospels and uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, I, just, I love them. I just think, I can't believe this. This is, this is the Lord's, this is Jesus. God visited the planet and walked among us and he's talking to this person and he's ministering in this context. He's providing teaching. I think that is so relevant and real for me now. And, 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 it, and it opens your heart to say, God, help me. Help me to be a peacemaker like you. You're my personal peacemaker. I want to be a peacemaker like you. But have a look at the scripture here. Um, it's a very moving account of Jesus who's just risen from the dead, he's resurrected, and he appears before his fearful disciples. And the disciples are scared stupid. They are up, they're locked in a room. They're thinking they're next. They've killed Jesus. And now they're going to kill us as well. And so even though Jesus talked to them about the necessity of him having to die, but he would rise again. And not just that, when he goes back to his father, he's going to send the Holy Spirit and he's going to empower them to go forward. Even though he said that many times to them, they still didn't quite get it. And so he appears to them on the evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and he said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And he says, guys, this peace can only come because of the cross. I had to die. I had to die. The grace of God has now come into your life and the result of that free grace, that salvation, is that you now have peace with the Father because the sin barrier is dealt with and now you have the peace of God and you have the power of peace to be able to build bridges between people. But it's all because of a cross. And we're going to take communion a bit later on, which helps us focus back on saying, you know what, if it wasn't for the cross, I can't be saved. If it wasn't for the cross, we wouldn't have a resurrected Christ. If it wasn't for the cross, I, I, we can't have peace. We can't have peace. We, we, we're still most disturbed. If Jesus didn't rise, he rose from the dead and uh, victorious over what put him to death, sin, death, Satan. He's conquered them through the cross. So he showed them his hands and side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, notice this, peace be with you. And then he says to them, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. He's not saying, now boys, just hang in there and wait until you die and come and be with me in heaven. He doesn't say that. He says, as the Father sent me and I am incarnated into this world, I've revealed to you what the Father is like. Because now I am sending you, as the Father sent me, I am sending you to continue what I commenced and keep doing it until the day that I come back. Or until you go to be to heaven for a short time and then before you know it, I've returned and you'll have your new body and your spirit, soul and body will come together. It, it's, it's a very hopeful message. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. What a passage, amazing passage. 
He imparts to them his peace, restoring them to a perfect father, even though they're imperfect because his blood was shed to cover the sin barrier between God and them. And, and, and we poignantly see that this reconciling peace with God and new life that is now given to us comes through a cross of death. It was a cross of death that brings new life. Then he empowers them by his presence to continue his ministry on earth and he equips them by the Holy Spirit to be able to do this. Wonderful scripture. Have you noticed, maybe you haven't noticed, but every one of Paul's letters, he commences the same way. Interestingly, is it coincidental or is it purposeful? He commences the same way. Let me read Romans 1, verse 7. To all in Rome, who are loved by God and called to be his holy people, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace comes first. There has to be a cross. There has to be someone dying in our place by which we can be reconciled to God the Father. Free grace, not cheap grace. It costs God the Father the life of his son. And then peace comes. Every one of his letters, 13 times. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. You think he's trying to get through to us? You can receive peace all the peace that you need. But you've got to experience his grace first. You've got to understand the free unmerited favour of God that comes to you as a free gift. And you can't do anything to earn it. You just say, ta, thank you. I see it. I receive it. I experience it. And it transforms my life. And then peace flows. So when we fully embrace Jesus' cross, we will experience Jesus' endless peace. If you need his endless peace today and you're saying, look, I'm, I'm not in a very peaceful state. When we come to communion, get a vision of the cross and your salvation. Be thankful. Appreciate what he's done. And, and, and you know what? Your understanding and experience of peace will flow. And the Holy Spirit will reinforce this to you. So thirdly, I want to say this. Jesus is our totally good and all wise peacemaking model. And uh, so if you want to know how to be a peacemaker, look at Jesus. He's totally good and he's totally wise. And, uh, and that's why we need to read and reread all of Jesus' teachings and, and his ministry encounters with all types of people. And when you read Paul's letters, particularly Paul's letters, you see that he actually opens up some of the teachings of Jesus and applies them interprets them and implies them. And, and, and so the, the Gospels, if you look at Paul's practical teaching, is he very much takes the words of Jesus and outworks them in, in how to live morally, ethically, how to function in a church, how to live with your wife and kids and husband and, and your neighbours and, you know, you're an employer, an employee, uh, people that are difficult. He actually outworks and, and lays a framework of moral, ethical teaching that builds on the Sermon on the Mount, that builds on the great statements of Jesus. And um, the four gospels are spellbinding in their portraits of Jesus. And the rest of the New Testament just opens up and interprets and applies post-cross, post-resurrection, post the giving of the spirit, post the birth of the church, looking back saying, okay, this is now how it applies to my life. And Jesus balances peacemaking and grace giving with honest truth telling, like nobody else. And it's hard for us to, to, to do it like him, but he actually says, you know what? Here's our peacemaking model. And he was totally good and totally wise. And, and uh, he balances this with honest truth telling. Look at John 1.14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only. He visited the planet. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Beautiful poetic language to explain the incarnation. But he became f a full human being, just like us. And we've seen his glory. We've seen the glory of the one and only son and, and who came from the father. Now it's full of grace and truth. 
The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus. And so Jesus was deadly honest with people, and he's still deadly honest today. He'll be deadly honest with you. He spoke the truth in love, as Paul says in Ephesians 4. And he was both courageous and sensitive. Look at what he says concerning our family relationships. I mean, this is a beauty. This is a, in different translations, this one rocks people. Because we think, oh, wow, that's a really hard statement. Some of his statements were really hard, but he's telling us the truth. Have a look at this, Matthew 10, in the message. Don't think I've come to make life cozy. I've come to cut, make a sharp knife cut between son and father, daughter and mother, bride and mother-in-law. Look, I understand that one. (laughs) Cut through these cozy domestic arrangements and free you to God. Well-meaning family members can be your worst enemies. If you prefer father or mother over me, you don't deserve me. If you prefer son or daughter over me, you don't deserve me. If you don't go all the way with me through thick and thin, you don't deserve me. If your first concern is to look after yourself, you'll never find yourself. But if you forget about yourself and look look to me, you'll find both yourself and me. I mean, I experienced this. I mean, I loved my parents and I, I still love them. Wear my dad's wedding ring, I've got my mum's cross around me. I mean, they're they're, they're magnificent people. But I can tell you, when I came to faith in the early 70s, my mum opposed me. And she did some things that, I don't want to besperch her memory, but they weren't very nice. And, And she opposed me because she thought I was joining some weird cult. (laughs) <laughs> and I was denying my Greekness. Don't you want to be Greek anymore? I said, of course I do. She goes, but you're Greek, you're Orthodox. What's this English religion? What's this new thing? And so she was really, and, and she opposed me very strongly. But, um, and there's, and there's, at times it's been difficult with my, my children who are precious to me. And oh, I tell you, the people you love the most are the ones that can hurt you the most. But what do you do? Do you react? If you're a peacemaker, you know, and, and you've, you've got to make sure you, you love in spite of the hurt that may come. It's a, it's, it's a tough word that Jesus gives us, but it's devastatingly true. By his wisdom and peace, he will help us go through these really hot and divisive times. You may be going through one now. We are to love our family and our friends dearly, even when they hurt us. I had a bunch of friends in the snooker world, and uh, you know, some of them respected my decision. Half of them respected my decision to become a Christ follower. And when they were going to play up, you know, drink, take some drugs, chase after girls, they wouldn't invite me anymore. Kind of like, they did it sneak, they did it sneakily. They didn't want to offend me, but they knew this is not Bill's life. The others, come on Bill, let's go. They were trying to evangelize me back into the world. And I had to make a break, and some of them I loved dearly. I had, to, I had to say, you know what? I cannot have them as friends anymore because they're not respecting Jesus in me, and they're trying to evangelize me back into drinking and smoking and drugs and chasing girls, all that kind of stuff. Whereas the others, who are still friends, never did that. It's very hurtful, very painful. But you've got to make those, you've got to make those choices. And, uh, and so... <laughs> You know, we're to love our family and friends, even when they hurt us. It's okay to disagree with them, but please learn to disagree in an agreeable fashion. Be agreeable. Hit the issue, but never the person. That's hard to do when your emotions are are stirred up. But uh, it is so important. That scripture that Jesus uh, gives, you know, you've got to balance peacemaking and grace giving with honest truth telling. Hey, Jesus... Peace discerningly umpires all our relationships. If you have Jesus on the inside, you've got the Holy Spirit living in you, he will be a spiritual umpire when there is potential danger. When there's things that go, ooh, and and at certain times, my peace gets so disturbed, it gets my attention. It's like the umpire of a game, like a footy game, he blows the whistle, whoa, hold it, everyone stops. And he sorts out the issue. (laughs) 
you know, in soccer, they give them a yellow card or a red card or a blue card. I don't know what they do. Go to the sin bin, you know. <laughs> time, for, time for the sin bin. Um, and so the Holy Spirit in us, where we ha- have peace with God, we have peace with God, we have the peace of God, we have peace to be able to build bridges with our fellow human beings, our family and friends. At times, he upsets that peace. And that's why Paul says, let the peace of Christ rule. You make the decision. Let him be the umpire. Don't kill the umpire. Don't fight the umpire. (laughs) Don't disagree with the umpire. Don't beat up the umpire, you know. Don't do what that naughty Greek tennis player does. Most talented boy we've seen in a long time playing tennis, but oh dear, it's all up here. Pray for him. He needs to get saved, that kid. Because Greeks are getting a bad name in Australia. (laughs) Anyway, I'm I'm off topic, guys. Let the peace of Christ rule, umpire, in your heart, since as members of one body, you were called to peace. Because God wants peaceful relationships but if if he has disturbed you something's up you see let me let you make a couple of comments here that that are hard to say but you know the reality of divorce is such a painful thing and some of you here have been divorced and remarried and uh, it's probably one of the areas where I found it most difficult in counselling and helping people over the years and, um, and maybe leading them to a place where they need to consider divorce. And um, um, it's hard, you know, like, why does God allow divorce and remarriage? Why? Why does he allow it? It was never his original intention, but we live in a world that's fallen, a world that's misaligned, and we must have social harmony and peace, otherwise we'll end up killing each other. And Jesus' word cannot be clearer. In Matthew 19, he says, Moses permitted divorce only as a concession to your hard hearts. But it was not what God had originally intended because the only reason Moses grants, allows divorce is because you're so hard-hearted. You're hard-hearted against God, against your wife, against your kids, against your neighbours. You know, you, you swear anger, violence and, and uh, stuff takes place. And, uh, but, you know, ha- otherwise, how do we handle... And I've handled these ones. I'm giving you examples without naming people. I've handled unrepentant men and women where physical violence is part of their marriage. And it can lead to murder, out of control rage. I've seen it, I've seen it. Men beating women, I've seen women beating men. It's not talked a lot about today because men are embarrassed to admit it. But there are situations where I've been involved where she's beaten the living daylights out of him. And he puts up with it. Wow. What about unrepentant adultery that destroys all trust? What about unrepentant illegal and legal drug abuse that is a danger to one's partner and children? Because people under the influence of, of drugs can do some amazingly bizarre things in their cars, at home, the danger. And these are unrepentant people. Um, unrepentant gambling addiction that steals the assets and financial savings of a family. Unrepentant, destructive, psychological, emotional and verbal abuse that so damages relationships, people want to kill themselves. And I've had people say, I just want to die. I just want to die. I can't put up with it. It's, it's hell. And um, I've advised these violated men and women, as hard as it is, I've actually advised them to divorce. It says, you're going to end up dead or in hospital or your kids are going to end up hating you because you, you've, you've, create, you've allowed this environment to continue. And uh, the Holy Spirit uh, gives us, I remember one situation where a man was uh, really, being vi- really being abused by his wife and she wasn't a believer 
and uh, she had an alcohol problem and, and uh, it was just terrible. But he just stuck at it, stuck at it, stuck at it, stuck at it. And I just was so disturbed. The umpire of the Holy Spirit disturbed me. And I think it might have been halfway through the night. I got up and I'm thinking, I think she's playing up. I think she's playing around. It's not just alcohol, it's actually... So I, I, I got the guy, got, I said, look, can I have a talk with you? I said, I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm a false prophet. But I've got this feeling. It could be the Holy Spirit, just could be me. If I'm wrong, I'm, I'm sorry up front. But I think you need to find out if she's playing up with, with some other fellas. And he was shocked. But something triggered in his mind. So he came home one night, he was doing night shift, two o'clock in the morning, and there she was. She had that man, in, in, a stranger in her bed. So I said, what are you going to do? Then we find out there's been many strangers in her bed. What diseases he could have had. And so thankfully, the right thing was that he divorced and he remarried a few years later, got some beautiful kids and he's a dear friend, and not in our church here. But uh, hey, look, it, it happens. Um, and so Jesus' word cannot be clearer. The apostle Paul, he applies and interprets Jesus' teaching in his letters. Um, and, and when you read Paul's letters, and particularly when he talks about marriage and sexuality and relationships, you get the feeling like he may have been married, but maybe he was married and divorced. We don't know. Um, it just seems strange that a man could have such an understanding of the intimate areas of life and not have experienced it, or whether he was, some commentators say, maybe he was engaged to be married, and when he became a Christian, because he was such a strict Pharisee, he would have had to marry somebody who was also very strict in Judaism, that perhaps that ended the relationship. But he's very smart and very wise, and he said this. He says, if the husband or wife who isn't a believer insists on leaving, in other words, the unrepentant neglect and abandonment, I know, they just take off <laughs> for three months, gone. Then come back and, and want to take up again. And I, Paul says, look, if, it, if the husband or wife who isn't a believer insists on leaving, let them go. In such cases, the believing husband or wife is no longer bound to the other for God has called us to live in peace. So God's whole purpose is, is not that he's for divorce, he's, he just wants peace, he wants harmony. He doesn't want anger and violence and, and ugliness and if we can remove that, that's why um, uh, I say what I'm saying here and I felt I needed to say it for some of you that maybe you're gonna be the, the vehicle that you need to speak to somebody in your world that is going through some trauma and perhaps they're confused about this whole matter. Speak to them, talk with them, share with them, empower them, help them. Not, not to take the, 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 that kind of abuse. Outside, that's why I've said unrepentant people. If a person repents and their repentance is, is as notorious as their sin, there's hope. One of our beautiful CRC pastors, John Poyser and his wife Jackie, uh, John's a dear friend, and, and uh, uh, we hear their story. I think we got him to share his story here many years ago. And um, uh, he, was, he was a terrible husband. And Jackie gets saved, and he becomes all violent. So he attacked her one night and starts choking her to death. He says, some demon took over, like his anger. And anyway, so she just said, that's it, I'm gone. So she left him, rightly so. Anyway, so he just thinks, what have I done? He comes to Christ. Many months later, proving that he's genuine repentant, he come, he, they get back together, and you wouldn't believe he's the sweetest, nicest pastor, counsellor that you can find. I said, John, you, you nearly killed your wife? How'd you? And I said, tell me more. How'd you do that? What happened? What's going on? I want to find out. So this is, um, he goes, I don't know what was going on, because I was just an angry man, and I just went nuts. So any sin can be forgiven. If a person comes to Christ and they receive forgiveness and they make restitution and they're restored. And so I'm not saying that that can't happen, it does happen. But where there's unrepentance, then we need to ensure that uh, we, um, um, you know, discerningly, Jesus peace umpires all our relationships. Finally, Jesus peace garrisons us in our times of turmoil. 
You might be going through a time of turmoil, I don't know, but this is a promise for you. It says, and the peace of God which transcends all our understanding and all of our misunderstandings will guard your hearts, will fortress your heart, will keep you, will keep your hearts and minds sane and sensible in Christ. All hell may be breaking loose around you, but Jesus' peace is your fortress and it will garrison you. Those peace can be an umpire to disturb you, to get your attention, or it can actually garrison you and fortress you in, in the difficulties of life. He is our, our peace. Jesus is our Prince of Peace. He is amazing. And he is our personal peacemaker. If you haven't made your peace with him, and you, you've been coming to church, and, but perhaps you know he is the Prince of Peace, but he's not your personal peacemaker. As we take communion, in a few minutes. Reach out to Christ and say, Lord, save me. Take the biscuit, drink the wine, say, Lord, I put my trust in you. You died for me. You live for me. I receive your forgiveness. I turn to you. I put my trust in you. He can become your personal peacemaker. And remember, Jesus is totally good and he's the all-wise peacemaking model. And you can't make any mistake when you follow his model as you read the scriptures. And his peace discerningly umpires all of our relationships. Let him be the umpire to help you. And let his peace garrison you in the tough times. Thank you, Lord. Let's stand.